Ladies and gentlemen, nice to have you all here and I know you're listening from all over the world. I'm actually in London and my name is Pete Abrahams. I'm a clinical anatomist uh, most of my life, as well as 45 years working as a GP in the National Health Service. But what I want to talk about today is a person who you probably feel is an artist. But what I'm going to prove to you today in this session is he was one of the world's greatest anatomists and used his knowledge of science to illustrate with specific new concept, concepts in the world of art and anatomy to illustrate how the body works. So first of all, Leonardo da Vinci, born in Florence. Uh, he died in fact in France in Amboise. And if you want a nice trip to Amboise Castle, uh, is a lovely place to go. And they've got models of all his engineering machines that he made to go and visit there. But basically he trained as an artist, as a young man in Verrocchio's art studios, but he was an extremely talented genius who did all sorts of things, whether it was art, engineering, cartography, he was a musician. But today I want to show you the dissections and the drawings that he made as an anatomist extraordinaire. And the pictures below here, you all know as being by Leonardo, what I'm going to show you are some wonderful, magnificent drawings. But before I do that, I want you to put it in a context. Leonardo was uh, working at the end of 1400s, beginning of the 1500s. This is 500 years ago. And the only pictures that he could use as reference in anatomy were these sort of pictures. And I think you can see that this one looks a bit like a sumo wrestler. And you can see that he's showing the bony systems of the body and you can see the vertebrae there. This one is showing the liver and the, the spleen and things. And these diagrams are pretty useless for anyone who wants to do medicine. And I know many of you listening are medical students and you would laugh if you saw those drawings in one of your modern times. So he had nothing to go by. These were the best drawings available anywhere in the world in the 1300s. And in fact, they were really until about the 1500s, and I'll tell you when, the only drawings of the human body that we seem to be able to find anywhere in the world. Now on the left here, I have four very important anatomical names that really you should know if you're in medicine or if you're in art, because they all were involved in both aspects. First of all, about 1,000, uh, sorry, about 2,000 years ago, we have G G Galen and Avicenna a thousand years ago and Hippocrates about 2,000 years ago. So the world of anatomy really starts before Galen with the Egyptians, Herodicus and other people who did dissection, but Galen was the one who published and for about 1,400 years, he was the guru of medical science. Then places moved towards the Arab world and a very famous person and any of the medical students listening, if they've never heard of him, go and look up Avi Chenna. He had a wonderful book called The Canon, which really is worth reading. But the first person to make a textbook of anatomy was Vesalius. And this was known as the Fabrica or De Humani Corporis Fabrica, published in 1543. Now 1543 is a very important date it's the same year that Copernicus published his heavenly bodies. It's the beginning of the scientific revolution. And what I want you to look at also, here's a very important anatomy artist, Sir Charles Bell, here he is above. And he was the one who gave us Bell's palsy and the long thoracic nerve of Bell. And many of you will know of the bell Majondi law in physiology. But look at these dates and what I want you to see is where is Leonardo da Vinci? He is 30 years, a whole generation before the published textbook, the first decent published textbook that went, if you like, went viral. Now you may say, well, how come we don't know much about Leonardo's anatomy and we're not using his books now? Please note that this is the most important thing you may learn as a young medical scientist, that he never published his work. And so no one really knew about it until the 19th century. 
Had it been published, the pictures I'm now going to show you, I'm sure medicine would have moved on incredibly quicker than it has done, particularly the anatomical side. So I'm going to now, in this lecture, show you on the left-hand side the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci. By the way, all of these, or nearly all of these, are uh, in Windsor. I'm spelt Windsor wrong with a D, Windsor uh, Royal Collection, and they are part of the Royal Collection owned by Her Majesty the Queen of England. And I would like to thank Martin, um, uh, who, uh, Martin Clayton, who is the master of the Royal Prince, who I worked with on an exhibition about a decade ago, who introduced me into the details of these magnificent drawings. So here, the first concept I want you to think about is that we have directional slices. Leonardo was the first person to slice the body down the sagittal plane. And here you can see a beautiful dissection through the coronal plane showing the maxillary sinus. And what I have done in most of these cases is taken a modern CT scan and re-made um, it to be exactly similar to what Leonardo did in his drawings. Remember, these are totally original drawings and extremely accurate. For instance, in this one, I think you can all see in this area, there are four little teeth. Now, for most of us, we all know there are 32 teeth. No one knew for sure how many teeth there were in those days. And in fact, the book said that women had less teeth than men. Well, we all know that women have the same number of teeth than men. That's not a sexist comment. It's a comment that they actually thought that women had less teeth. It's rather like uh, women's brains. Women's brains are smaller, anatomically speaking, but they have better connections in the corpus callosum. And so that's why women are better at multitasking. But he actually described each of these different teeth, saying which ones cut, which ones grind, the molars grind, and drew them very accurately. So everything that he did is he dissected, he drew it, and he had new ideas for displaying the actual three-dimensionality of the human body. So let us move on. Here is what we have it by him. And here is a coronal slice exactly the same on a modern MRI scan. So let's look at the next concept. Again, a totally original concept. He took a slice through the head. And as you can see from here, he actually layered all the layers of the scalp and the layers of the meninges. Here they are, look at the bottom. You can see all of the different layers and this is known as the onion man for obvious reasons, because he drew an onion to say that the layers of the scalp are like the layers of an onion. And if you compare it with my own modern dissection in a, a modern textbook, that is exactly how we teach the layers of the scalp. S-C-A-L-P for skin, cutaneous tissue, aponeurosis, loose areola tissue, periosteum. And students the world over learn the scalp in that way, in exactly the same way as he set it up. But what I think is fascinating, where you see this red arrow, he shows that from the brain, some layer comes out around the eye, and that is actually true. We know that the, um, the dura mater surrounds the optic nerve and comes to the back of the eye. And that's an extremely important anatomical fact if we are going to understand papilledema. By the way, in this particular drawing, the cisterns inside the brain, which he shows as three bubbles, are exactly the way that um, Galen did it, and they're anatomically totally wrong. But in a couple of slides more, I will show you how he did it and got it right a few years later. So another concept was looking at axial and transverse layers. Here we're looking at the two eyes, and he sliced across, and we have the, um, as you can see from this, uh, CT, axial CT that's running through on the left hand side, you can see the optic chiasma. You can see it also on a modern dissection from the visible human project, which you can access off the web if any of you wish to. And he actually put in and got correct all the nerves going through this area, which is known as the cavernous sinus. So here we have a guy who not only is managing to dissect everything from no one has produced pictures like that by 1500, but he is actually drawing them correctly and even showing here the little cribriform plate, which is the uh, holes in the top of the ethmoid bone to allow the first optic nerve to go through, the first cranial nerve, the optic nerve. 
So that's another concept that was totally new to both education, drawing, and to anatomy. Now, I just mentioned the cerebral ventricles, and here is his drawing of the cerebral ventricles, which in this particular case, he put inside a skull. But here is the drawing of the cerebral ventricles. And you can see they have a certain shape with two horns there, a big bit in the middle. This is the fourth ventricle, the third ventricle, and the left ventricle. Here is a modern CT slice. And here is my own uh, book where you can see that has been injected. And then we have got a, uh, an imprint, if you like, or a solid uh, mass uh, of the ventricles. Now you wonder how on earth did he do that? And hang on, those don't look exactly the same as that. And we now know exactly what happened. He couldn't get a human brain, so he got a cow's brain. And what did he do? He used the lock, lost wax casting method, which artists have used for many, many years and are very commonly used. He injected into the brain, filled up the ventricles, which are the hollow part of the brain that you can see here and here, and he then took off the brain tissue, so he was left with the hollow of the brain. In other words, it was the first ever injection into a body cavity, which is quite amazing that no one had ever done that before. Why do we know it was a cow's brain and not a human brain? Because he was so accurate in his drawing, you can see a rather feathery looking thing at the base of the brain here, which is this thing that I've taken from a cow's brain from the Royal Veterinary College, and that is called the rete mirabile. It's a sort of venous tract at the base of the brain, which cows have, but we don't have it in humans. So we know he slightly cheated. He used a cow's brain and then put the cow's brain's ventricles into the human drawing that he had done. But this is the first time ever anyone thought to inject using the lost wax casting method to see a cavity inside the human body. Personally, I find this picture drawing of his or drawings, as you see, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven separate drawings on this one page of the vertebral column is quite amazing. It is the first time anyone has shown the different shapes with the, with the lumbar lordosis, the cervical lordosis, the typhosis of the thoracic region. And there you can see the sacrum. In fact, he was the first person to draw and accurately describe the sacrum as being five fused vertebrae, which we can see beautifully on the actual patient uh, vertebral column, which is rotating on the right. But what I want you to look at here is this amazing. C1, C2, and C3, the upper three cervical vertebrae, using what we call the explosion technique, commonly used in engineering. We see it on adverts on the telly. But look, he actually lined up everything to show how these three rather odd-shaped vertebrae fitted together. That alone was totally unique. Had he published in a modern-day sense, the fact that the sacrum was five fused vertebrae, it would be a front page of nature. It was that unique, that amazing to people who had not ever seen the vertebral column. And this picture is 500 years old. This is taken in the last five years from a CT scan. But he wasn't perfect. None of us are. He occasionally made mistakes. And I want you to look very carefully at this area of the sternum in a live human who is alive and well and living in Warwick. And as it comes round again, you can see the sternum here and the manubrium there. And you can see on his drawing, by the way, this one piece of paper is literally the size of an A4 piece of paper. And yet he's got verte virtually all the vertebrae, all the uh, scapula, the humerus, he's got the leg bones and the whole of the arm bones. The only thing he's not got in here is the hand and it's all on one page. But he has made a boo-boo. And you can see he showed a segmented vertebra. Now, as it happens, in development, the human vertebra is segmented, but it does not remain segmented in the adult. But this structure here is what? Well, I hope many of you are thinking, oh, that's odd. I've never seen that before. Probably not because it's an orangutan. And the lower vertebrae of the lower sternum of lower, if you like, apes have got segments. And how did he do that? He cheated. 
And we think he probably cheated from what Galen had drawn because he often followed Galen and tried to improve on. And in this case, he didn't bother to actually dissect stern and pop. I want you to look at this little circle down in the bottom right hand corner and you can see what he's looking at is everything from different angles. This is a modern CT and this is his drawings of the arm and shoulder. And you will see he is actually showing it just like we would eight pictures together to pan across and see the whole of the shoulder from all different angles. That's just a little picture of the four C's and the back of the mouth, which he doodled on things, which he often did. But here you can see he's amazingly got all the anatomy of the shoulder and arm anatomically correct from all different angles, which is the way we used to make movie films like Mickey Mouse movie films by drawing lots of pictures and then flicking them and we made them move. Some of you may even have cartoon books like that these days. So here is a guy that has a totally new concept yet again. His sixth new, if you like, anatomical or artistic concept that he applied to the human body. He also was interested to look inside things. And so he often drew things that were solid as just vector lines. He called them threads. And you can see this is in fact the um, pectoralis major muscle. And it's coming off the chest, but he wanted to show that it comes from lots of different origins. But he also wanted to show underneath the armpit and showed it by using what he called threads to show deep exposure. Now, nowadays, we can even do better than that. We can take the muscle, show it in 3D movement, as we do for teaching students, and show when it is contracting and relaxing. And you can see as it contracts, it goes green. As it relaxes, it goes brown. And we can actually work out and through the whole body in a similar situation. A very good way of teaching students. This page always um, gives me great pleasure because this page we know was done in 1500s. We know that in the page he describes perfectly that this muscle, biceps, has two separate actions. And what I want all of you to do that are sitting there, take your right arm, flex the elbow to 90 degrees and put your left hand on your biceps, which is your Popeye muscle. I'm sure most of you have got one, there it is, bicep. Put your left hand on biceps and now I want you to put your hand flat on the table and turn your hand up to the ceiling in this movement which is called supination. And you will feel that the biceps contract. And he said on this page, that not only does the biceps flex the elbow, but it actually supinates the hand. That description was not available to the world of science till 1723 by Chesildon, an English anatomist. In other words, he was the first person ever by 200 and odd years, 240 years, to describe the idea that a muscle could have two movements for the same muscle. That is conceptually an amazing idea. But knowing that the hand was very important, he wrote three or four pages, or drew three or four pages, as well as writing. This is his writing, which, by the way, is mirror writing. That's why you can't read it very easily. And he said, if you're going to understand the hand, you start with the bones, just like we do. And here are the carpal bones moving beautifully. And you can see what happens as they move in extension, abduction, flexion, etc. And he see this little bone here, this little bone here, he, he singles out in his text. And there it is with the red arrow. It's the little pisiform. And again, he's the first person to explain that the pisiform bone, that little bone that's over the laser now, is in fact inside a tendon and is therefore a little seed, and a little seed is a sesamoid bone. So he's the first person to actually describe and understand the idea that little bones in tendons give a mechanical advantage. He was a very good engineer and he realized it gave a mechanical advantage uh, to that pulley system or that bone system from that muscle that goes into that bone works more efficiently if it has a little bit of strengthening of the bone. 
His second picture of the hand is amazing that it actually starts with the bones. And then the second picture is the little muscles of the hand, the big muscles of the hand, which you can see on the right that we've now made into models in 3D. But every single muscle that is in that model that we now know he had got in the dissection. Even the pulleys on the finger at the top here, you can see a little bent finger and the little pulleys that we now find very important for things like trigger finger and things that get the thumb, that he even describes in the text. So not only did he do brilliant dissections of every little muscle in the hand, but he even showed here he is showing the first dorsal interosseous with little threads, an amazing feat of both artistic ability and dissection ability. His next concept was a rather original one, though he did mess it up a bit, as I will show you. And he took a lady, woman, he called this. And by the way, this is a very big, it's four. There are actually four different um, uh, drawings, but it's all on one piece of paper called a Bologna piece of paper. And if you look at the CT scan, there is the liver, there is the spleen, these are the kidneys. And you can see he has the liver with the black arrow, the spleen over here. The heart, by the way, is wrong. It doesn't have two chambers. And if you look at the neck, you will see that the deltoid here, the blue arrow and the yellow arrow, which is going to trapezius, are really not very womanly. And if you look at this picture, you immediately say, hang on, the breasts don't look very womanly. The trapezius doesn't look very womanly. The deltoid doesn't look very womanly. And of course it isn't. He used the outline of the male model because there weren't women models in those days. But I want to take you down to D. I call this D because this structure looks a bit like Darth Vader. To me. And this is meant to be the uterus. And in fact, it's got seven little chambers here which is what Galen proposed. And I know that he cheated on this uterus because I've looked at every mammal and every animal I could find and none of them have uteruses like that. I think he enlarged a structure which we do have, the round ligament of the uterus, and he made it look like horns. But as I will show you later, he corrected himself not long after this, about a year or two later, and did a much better dissection of the uterus. But the idea of doing one diagram with all the anatomy of a specific person, in this case a woman, was a great idea. But the fact is he cheated and the breasts, the muscles and in fact the uh, uterus, I think, were all cheats. What is also interesting, some of you will observe that the liver looks small and the spleen looks big. And, and we have a theory that maybe this is someone who had a disease called schistosomiasis which you can go away and look up if you don't know anything about it. But a sailor from Venice might well have traveled to Egypt and picked up schistosomiasis. And we know the person that he got this dissection of the liver and spleen from was a very old man that he actually was at his bedside when he died, who could have been a sailor. We don't know for sure. But there's a nice, interesting bit of research to do there. He also had a yet another concept, and this time the concept was to take a single functional system, in this case the portal venous system, which those of you in medical school will know joins the spleen to the liver and takes all the goodies from the, the, the gut via the portal vein and via the veins of the gut down here which he drew beautifully. And you can see the red arrow there. There's the portal vein on one of my images, in fact, the image of the portal venogram in an x-ray book. Here's the spleen, here's the splenic vein, here's the portal vein, and here is the portal venous system in the liver. Some of you are very smart, may have noticed that this is a Riedel's lobe. If you've not heard of that, go and look it up later. A Riedel's lobe of the liver, which can confuse one with a tumor. But he again had a concept that he wanted to show people a complete functional system in one drawing. You also might notice that he put in here the little appendix, the small bowel and the large bowel, just a little doodle at the side, beautifully anatomically drawn. By the way, that is the first time that the appendix appears in any anatomical drawing anywhere. And of course, this is 1500. This picture, which is a beautiful picture, I think, showing the peritoneum covering over the bowel. Here is the bowel covered in peritoneum, the greater omentum, we call it, 
coming down off the lower border of the stomach. Here is the stomach, here's the spleen, and this is the greater omentum covering the bowel. Now, this was actually the first picture that Martin Clayton showed me. And he said, Peter, I don't understand. What on earth is there? There's the umbilicus. What on earth is this tube coming up from the umbilicus and going to the liver? Well, all of you who are good medics or have done the anatomy of the gut will know that there is a tube going from the umbilicus to the um, liver. And it's number two on this dissection, which I did to try and sort out what this drawing was showing. And you can see it's the remaining left umbilical vein. And if we look up here, here's the umbilicus up here on my drawing of the inside of the anterior abdominal wall. Here is the left umbilical vein. By the way, it is used clinically in uh, young babies for exchange transfusions, and they can be exchanged transfused through the umbilicus. And then I looked at these tubes going up the umbilicus, and the green one, the medial umbilical ligament, is absolutely correct. Number six in my drawing goes up the umbilicus there. But the number four here, he didn't get quite right because it doesn't actually go to the umbilicus. It goes parallel to the umbilicus up the anterior abdominal wall. And when I looked at the picture very carefully and you see there's the umbilicus, there's the umbilicus. Lo and behold, he had drawn in number four here. So here is the inferior epigastric vessels. Here are the superior epigastric vessels coming off the internal thoracic artery and vein. And he got it correct in this picture, but he got it wrong in this diagram. This tube should have gone more up the anterior abdominal wall as this tube should have gone there. A little error, but only a very slight error of misjudgment. And yet in this picture on the far left, he got it absolutely right where they anastomose at the umbilical area. At the time, no one knew how the blood got round the body. And it wasn't till 1628 that Dumotu Cordis by Harvey, and you've all heard of Harvey, an Englishman who went over to Padua and they said to have discovered that the, the, um, the passage of blood. Uh, there was in fact in the 12th century, Nafis, a Arab anatomist or physician, had already described the pulmonary circulation, but it Till the 1600s, but till we were pretty sure what the valves were all about, because people were talking about Galen's humours in those days and did not understand the mechanics. What you will see in his drawing is beautiful valves down in the red box down here. And a lot of people a uh, hundred years ago said, oh, this is rubbish. He's not got the heart right at all. Now, of course he hasn't, because he's showing an ox's heart, not a human heart. And he got a lot of ox's heart from the avatar and he did some very interesting experiments. So although people thought he'd messed up, this is beautiful anatomy of an ox's heart. And if a veterinarian looks at those, they are very impressed. A medic looks at it and says, oh, it doesn't look very like the human heart. Because by the way, it isn't. He then did some amazing experiments on the flow of blood. He was very interested in flow because he was very interested in mechanics, he was very interested in uh, how water flowed in rivers. And you, these things that look like, um, what do we call it? I'm trying to think of um, candy floss. These candy floss pictures here, 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 were all of his drawings trying to show what happened in vortices in fluids. In other words, currents in fluids. And he actually did an experiment which is showed here where he made a model of the aortic valve and he pushed water through the aortic valve with little seeds, millet seeds in the water and watched how the seeds spun around. And he postulated that the, <coughs> the flow of blood through the valve made a retrograde vortex, which pushed the valve shut. That is an amazing idea. And it wasn't till colored MRI came out about 20 years ago. In other words, it took from 1511 to roughly 2000 before we could see this on an MRI, watch the blood go through the aortic valve and then go round here. It goes through the valve and pushes the valve down. So it's taken us 500 years to prove something that he showed and postulated in his paper on the aortic valve. 
amazing. If any of you are particularly interested in the heart and Leonardo, can I recommend a wonderful book by Frank Wells, The Heart of Leonardo. He's a cardiac surgeon at Cambridge and has written a really wonderful book on all the anatomy and how amazingly accurate Leonardo was. But this is something that brings us up to date, up to date now. Here's a picture that he did in 1485, and he was the first person to slice through the body, in this case a leg, and look at what we call compartments. Now that doesn't, if you're not an anatomist, that doesn't excite you, even an anatomist, it's not that exciting, until around 2000, we started doing MRI scans, and we can see the different component parts. This white line is a fascia. This white line there is a fascia. This is another fascia down here. And we can see the compartments of muscles. We then had plastination from von Hagen's. And again, you can see the fascial planes and you can see the fascia are white mostly there. Here are the adductors. Here are the quadriceps, the flexors. Here are the, uh, well, the flexors of the knee. Here are the um, flexors of the hip and the knee. And you can see, you can see the compartments have got fascia in between them. But it wasn't until very recently that fascia became very important. There is now a journal of fascia. And again, we've fascinated the fascia of the leg. And you can see the little compartments are all made because there are fascia between each compartment of muscles. And guess what? He got it right. He got it right where the bones were and where each compartment of muscles was. Something that is pretty impressive, cross-sectional anatomy, which is relatively new in the last uh, 100 years, but he, 500 years ago, thought to do it and do it correctly with the fascial idea, could dividing off the different compartments of muscles. Now I take you to this picture, which mm, I think probably every one of you listening to me now has already seen, even if you weren't in medical school and you've never been to medical school, you should recognize this. And I'm going to chatter a lot of people's ideas. It's a lovely picture. It's very interesting. He was talking about proportions of the human body, but actually it was complete rubbish. I don't want to be rude to him, but he did not know anything about genetics. And he didn't realize that each different part of the body has a genetic maker. So let me give you a, a quick example. Uh, I'm quite short, you can't tell, particularly seeing me here talk to you, but I'm uh, about five foot five. I have a very good friend, Greg, in America, and he may even be listening now for all I know. Uh, hi, if you are. Now, when Greg and I sit down for dinner at my house, we are eye to eye sitting at a table. In other words, our upper body is about the same height. But when I stand up and Greg stands up, you would laugh if he was here because he is six foot three. In other words, he's almost a foot taller than I am. And the reason is this bit in Greg is about a foot longer than mine. I have a very short femur. He has a very long femur. So drawing the idea of proportions in humans is actually just not on because they didn't know about the variation of genetic variation. An interesting problem, but this was a lovely picture and very famous. We're coming near to the end of this talk, and I want to, of course, bring in a bit of sex. A lot of you are young medical students, and of course, you wake up at this point and think, oh, wow, that's interesting. He actually drew sexual intercourse. Here is the male. Here is the lady. Here is the lady. There's the lady's breast. And there is the nipple. The green arrow is going down to the lady's breast. And you will notice some very odd things. And he said, like Galen, in other words, he was copying Galen's ideas. The concept was that babies were made from three spirits. There was the spinal pathway, which was the animal soul. That's in yellow. There was the spiritual pathway that came from the heart. And there was the material pathway. In that sense, he was quite true. And he also said that the testes were the cause of ferocity. But it was amazing that he actually drew, which was total rubbish, these all going down to the penis. And there was contribution from the testes, from the spine, and from the heart. But what is even more interesting, he said that the nipple and the milk that comes out of the nipple 
in fact, has was originally the menses. In other words, when a woman's period stopped and she's pregnant, he postulated that the menses, the bleeding, becomes milk. Now, I know to most of us in this room that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but that was his postulation. And he was slightly right because he drew from the nipple down to the uterus a pathway. Now, that pathway does not exist in, in anywhere in the world, but there is a pathway between the nipple and the uterus, and it's called the endocrine. In fact, oxytocin is the main one, but there are endocrine secretions that when the baby suckles, it goes down and causes the uterus to contract. So in theory, he was right. In practice, he was completely wrong. But conceptually, he was right. I showed you that his original uterus was Darth Vader, but here, later on, a year or so later, he drew a uterus where I'm very likely, pretty sure, that he had a woman to dissect and drew the uterus and the testes and the um, seminal vesicles really pretty accurately. And you can see in this picture, he's drawn the woman's pelvis much more accurately than the previous picture you saw. Just to give you an idea, if you're not medical and you're an artist, this is what the uterus looks like on a laparoscopic view. Here is the top of the uterus. Here's the Darth Vader bit I was talking about. This is the um, uh, number 12 here. You can see that this is a, like a um, horn almost going off the top of the uterus. Here is the ovary. Here is the um, fallopian tubes. And you can see this is what the uterus looks like from the top looking inside the abdomen. Here is the gut in the lying um, above and sort of behind the uterus. So he actually revised his drawing a few years later and pretty well got it right. And you can see this bobbly thing here, the yellow arrow is the actual seminal vesicle, which is a pretty reasonable interpretation of the seminal vesicle. It is a wiggly bag of, uh, of, of uh, tissue that actually stores the semen. And we come now to my last uh, main picture, and of course, here is the baby. This is known in the trade as the, um, you can see here, this is known as the Velcro placenta. And I think you can all see why it's called Velcro. It looks exactly on the same principle as Velcro. His drawing of the baby is amazingly accurate, whereas his drawing of the uterus like a big sort of nut is not so good, I will agree. But the position and the drawing of the baby is really quite amazingly accurate. And you can see here is the baby. Let me just see if I can take that off. And if you see the baby in utero, and this is a um, real baby, as you can see, it is very similar to his drawing. And at the time, one of my uh, daughters was pregnant and she uh, went and got a 4D scan of her baby. And this is baby Bujo. Um, in, in utero, and of course, babies grow up, and that is, well, actually, I must be honest, that was a few years ago, he's out skateboarding today, um, and I think you will see how beautifully he got the position of the baby in utero. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've given you insight into the genius of Leonardo, a genius not just as an artist, but as an experimental anatom anatomical scientist, and whose artistic concepts were totally new. Nearly all of the things I've shown you were totally new and they predated all modern radiology, which now gives us the ability to see many, if not all of those structures in movement and in life. If any of you are particularly keen to um, see more of Leonardo's paintings, Leonardo uh, for iPad is an amazing iPad. I think it's about five pounds, probably about eight dollars, and has most of the 200 pictures that are in the um, museum uh, or in Windsor Castle in the Queen's Royal Collection. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I will try and answer them. Hi, Peter. This is. Uh... Deborah from Elsevier here. I just wanted to say how fascinating that session was. We've had lots of really amazing feedback and lots of questions for you if you have uh, maybe 10 minutes to take I, a few I'll more. certainly try and answer them. 
Amazing, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, the first question. Um, the person has said, hi, Professor, greetings from India. Um, <laughs> I have a question. The surgical scalpel was invented in 1914. What do you think Leonardo could possibly have used as tools for dissection? Very good question. In fact, there were what we would now call surgical scalpels. They weren't exactly the same as a surgical scalpel, but he had a small saw that he saw of the skull, which you saw in the first few slides. He had scalpels and he basically dissected with his fingers, which were very mucky. And of course he didn't have rubber gloves. Uh, and remember the bodies weren't embalmed. So it was a pretty disgusting thing to do. And he even remarked how difficult and disgusting he was, and disgusting he was in doing it it was smelly, it was horrible, and it was done usually in the dark dungeon of a hospital or a, um, a religious order of some sort. But the scalpels that he used were scalpels, and if you look at Vesalius's work, which was, uh, what, 40 years later, they had a collection of different scalpels, but they weren't scalpels that you could pull the, the knife off, like a modern scalpel. They were usually things that you sharpened on a stone. That's great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we've got lots of questions from people who are amazed at the, the level of detail in the drawing. So I've got one here. How could he draw? Oh, sorry. How did he draw all of these pictures without monitoring an X-ray? <laughs> he, he only drew the ones on the left, but all the ones on the right that I showed you, which were mostly CTs and 3D CTs, are obviously modern ones that I've taken in Warwick in the last five, 10 years. But he, he didn't have an X-ray, he actually dissected each structure. Mm -hmm. And he had an amazing ability to see 3D. Some very good artists can really see in three dimension. And he was obviously one of those people. Not only was he a genius, but he was actually a very meticulous 3D recorder. So I have a really um, similar question here. Um, how was he aware of such beautiful diagrams when MRCT was not available? I guess that's the same answer. Well, he wasn't. He, 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 those are original drawings. They, if I tell you one bit of the story that many people, I didn't have time to because I wanted to show you things. These pictures were basically locked away in a library from the 1600s given to Prince Charles, who is Prince Charles of England, uh, having been given to him by a nobleman, they were in a portfolio in a big leather home, and they were put on the shelf in the library of Windsor Castle, and they sat there for 300 years. So he had no, there was no way that he had any access to anything that could be modern. Mm. These were all made in the 1480s, the 15, 11, and they were totally original, which is really a great shame because had people seen all of those, medical science would have moved on quicker. So Peter, do you know why um, Leonardo da Vinci's anatomy was unpublished? Is, is there yes. a reason? No, he was going to publish, well, there is probably. He got his bodies, some of them, when he was doing a lot of dissecting from a, a anatomy professor or yeah, anatomy professor in a place called Pavia in Italy. And he got the bodies through the professor of anatomy, Mark Antonio de la Torre, and sadly, in I think it was 12, 12, uh, 15, 12 or 15, 30, De La Torre got the plague, which was common in those parts in those times, and he died. And that's when he dried up his supply of cadavers. Oh. So he basically had access to cadavers through either religious orders or through churches or through hospitals that let him dissect. And it wasn't illegal to dissect. It was just so disgusting that no one would do it. Um, and, uh, but when his connection with the professor of anatomy and Javier dried up, the, his research sort of dried up. What a shame. Oh, absolutely. The, the world of science would be better off if he'd published those pictures because thousands of young men from all over Europe and the world would have gone into anatomy and made many more discoveries mm -hmm. in the 1500s. And, and, it, and it took many, many years for many of those discoveries to be made. Wow. 
I have a qu another question, slightly different. Hello, Professor Abrahams. I have two questions. How far do you think Leonardo was bold to challenge Galen's prevailing ideas, as you mentioned many? Very bold. <laughs> um, I think people often ask me, do you think he understood the, um, the passage of blood through the heart and after all his research? I am suspicious that he actually understood what was published 110 years later by Harvey, but was scared to say it because the church would have nailed him in the way that his friend Galileo, who was looking at the stars, said, oh, the, the, the earth is not the center of the universe, and he got excommunicated. I think he probably was worried about that aspect. Because remember, the church dictated what was right and what was wrong. And the sure. idea of being an original scientist was not yet uh, on the cards. Now, when Vesalius published his Fabrica in 1543, he again had a lot of new ideas, but some of his ideas still referred back to Galen. So Galen, for 1400 years, was a very influential person. Okay, thank you. And the second part of that question, is this probably the first illustrations with a spatial component of 3D anatomy? Absolutely. There is nothing in the universe that anyone has found that even holds a candle to these pictures. The next person who manages anything similar is the Fabrica in 1543 by Vesalius. And I actually have a, a modern copy of that in my room here. And it is a stunning book which has recently been translated into English. Um, but, but it was 40 years before any other textbook of anatomy, even vaguely as good. And if you want my personal opinion, I think some of his drawings are still the best drawings of certain aspects of anatomy that anyone's ever done. Well, I've got a question now about, um, you mentioned the heart uh, and the drawings that he used showing the the blood pumping around the heart yeah so I've got a question here Leonardo used millet seeds to study the and I'm sorry if I say this wrong eddy currents in the heart correct, correct. but but how did he keep the heart pumping in a cadaver to study the eddy currents okay very good he didn't do it in a cadaver what he did he looked at how the heart and the aortic valve were and he made a model with a glass blower who was a very skilled glass blower and then push the millet seed water through the small opening of the of the what was like an aortic valve and watch the millet seeds spin round. Hence his pictures that look like candy floss. Okay, thank you. Um, that's put me off candy floss forever. I'm sure. <laughs> Not a bad thing. Um, I have a slightly different question here. Um, hello, I'm an anatomist teaching various programs at university level. I have a question regard, uh, regarding Professor Abraham's contribution to the textbooks he has collaborated on. How did he and team approach creating images, diagrams, etc.? Did they use full body dissection to create precise images or other methods? Right. The, the one book on the left, The Clinical Atlas of Human Anatomy, is all over the last 45 years dissections of, of, of cadavers that were donated voluntarily in the medical schools. And they are all real dissections. None of the ones in that atlas are uh, radiological, except for the links, if you like, clinical links that are in the book to the same structures radiologically. The imaging atlas of human anatomy is a totally uh, an atlas of total normal radiological anatomy of every anatomical structure in the body. And there are some links back to dissection. But one is a dissection atlas, the other is a radiological, normal radiological atlas. Um, sorry, Peter, that um, I got distracted by all the questions. Um, okay. Just wanted to read out a couple of comments. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. I've been an anatomist for almost 20 years now, and I've not heard most of this information before. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor. Um, I'm uh, pleased to educate some of my colleagues and younger colleagues who, who should know about the history of this guy because he was just an absolute genius. And another one saying, Professor, that was so good. Such a useful lecture. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> 
Another question here, is there any evidence that he dissected further in the female besides the uterus? If so, did he notice different sexual diamorphism characteristics? I think not. We aren't sure, but we think he probably only dissected a couple of female bodies. He seemed to have dissected 20 or 30 bodies in his, if you like, career. Um, and we think only a couple of those were actually female. His last ones that I showed of the uterus were pretty accurate, so one gets the feeling he probably did dissect an actual lady. Um, the one I showed of the woman was just a fabrication to try a new idea, and obviously he cheated on the uterus. Um, I think the reality was that most of the, most of the people that you got for dissection were either in a hospital or they were criminals that had been hung. And consequently, the very few women were criminals. And that's probably still true today. <laughs> um, so thank you, Peter. Uh, just uh, another question now, slightly different tact. And this is about um, resources. So I'm just going to read this one out, if I may. Maybe we just have time to take one or two more questions. Um, please, can you suggest to me what should be my preferred set of resources for learning anatomy? Specifically is, for example, for example, if I want to learn the musculoskeletal system in a way I can logically connect muscle location with its nerve supply, lymphatic drainage, blood supply, and of course, its primary and secondary actions, if any, because frankly telling, I couldn't find anything even right. with all the muscle names. Can I ask where that person comes from or not? Do you know? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, somebody called Kumar, but I don't know the country. Okay. That I from. think in most parts of the world, I would say that the best way to learn anatomy is dissection. The second best way is prosection, where you're presented with a dissected human body in one shape or form, of which plastinated bodies are now very common in many parts of the world. And you then need a very good atlas, which shows you the actual dissection so you can study them and see the relationship. When it comes to movements, you, there are quite a few 3D programs, 3D anatomy programs, which I showed you some there of movements of the muscles. There are two or three major companies that do 3D movements of all the muscles. And I would reckon you should have a look on the web 3D programs with muscle movement. Thank you, Peter. We we did have a response actually, and the person was calling from India. Fine. I, he will then have access to either a book like mine, and there are many other atlases of actual dissection. But the other thing to do is go to get a three D computer program of muscle movement. Okay. And there are at least three major companies that do good ones. Um. Just one other question here then. Um, hello, Professor. I have a different question that does not relate so much to the topic, but do you have more books for anatomy? I think I can think of two, Peter, that, that you know quite well. And what's the best way you recommend for a medical student to always stay updated? Now, I think you just touched upon that in your last answer. Yeah, I mean, but... I, I have a couple of books, one of which is an atlas, another which is a radiological normal anatomy atlas. There are textbooks, and I personally have written textbooks, you go on uh, the web, there are hundreds of anatomy textbooks. It's a matter of finding one that you can cope with. I would say personally, I think many of the books are too big and fat and I have nothing against books for reference, but I think you will not cope learning your anatomy if you're a medical student, if you have a book that's more than about four to 500 pages. So I feel very strongly, you should have an atlas and you should have a book, but I would not buy a book that is 2000 pages. Okay. You Thanks. can't cope with it. There's too much information. Um, and so maybe um, just take this last question. I mean, this, this is asking about some uh, new discovery of anatomy, Peter. So I'll just ask the question. Yeah. Hello, sir. What is your comment on the new discovery of new glands inside the nasal cavity while screening cancer patients? Okay, I know nothing about it, even though I've been a practicing doctor for 45 years. The glands are probably um, glands that we have elsewhere in the body and someone's just found them in an unusual location. So I can't comment on the actual paper, but it wouldn't surprise me if someone has found some apocrine glands or some weird different glands up the nose. The one thing that the nasal cavity has, which is very important, is not so much glands, but the tissue that is there connected with the olfactory nerve. 
that has been found to be very useful for transplant where people have spinal injuries. So there are areas of the body that in the last 10 or 20 years, the anatomy has been used for a clinical purpose. So I do have one final question because I am struggling to bring this session to a close, Peter, because it's so fascinating and we've had so many questions coming in. But somebody asked this right at the beginning of the session, what is the progress in anatomy at the moment? Right, I, th I would say the progress in anatomy is that um, technology has helped the understanding of anatomy. I, as a medical student, only had a book of pictures, dissection pictures, similar to the atlas that I now do. In fact, as a student, I used the first edition of Bog McMinn's atlas that is now Abrahams and McMinn. But that was virtually all. Nowadays, I'm involved in making 3D videos, um, Apple apps, 3D and 4D videos that can show you like that baby I showed you moving in utero. So anatomy has become much more clinically orientated. So people who are going to become doctors should be learning their anatomy um, using the modern technology like MRI and CT and re angiography. And most good textbooks and, and programs do have pictures of those things or on the website, they will have 3D video. Well, um, Peter, I just wanted to say on behalf of us here at Elsevier, thank you ever so much um, for the session today. I think I've said it more than once, but it was truly fascinating. And I'm just going to end with some words here from one of our audience. Amazing session, Professor. Thank you. So I also want to thank everyone on the line for attending and for sending in the questions and for making it um, so interactive. OK, can I just say if any of you seriously have any other questions, you can get my email off Warwick University website UK or off Girton College Cambridge website UK and I will respond to your email. Thanks again, Peter. It was a wonderful Pleasure. session. Thank you Pleasure. very much. Thanks. Bye, Thanks everyone. everyone on the line. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.